Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest, and hopefully you'll put, take, like me, just maybe get rid of your phone because... Uh, we don't want to make, have no interruptions at this point in time because it's very. <laughs> we're looking at some very important issues here this, today. Okay, now I've got my phone out. Now I think we can talk. Okay. All right. We're, we're, we're community television, <laughs> right? We can do that, right? Well, hey, folks, um, welcome. I'm sure that everyone's relaxing out there today because this is um, this is Labor Day, you know, right? We, this is Labor Day, and every year we tend to celebrate during this particular time. People put all their wares in the cars and whatever, and get. Uh, get spots out in the various camping areas or they'll they'll go from point A to point B and whatever. But it basically it's supposed to be a relaxed day if you have a job. Yeah. If you have a job you can get out of town, you can buy the gas to do it and all those kinds of things and whatever. But it is Labor Day. And <coughs> so uh, what we're gonna do, we're gonna spend some time on um, on talking about Labor Day and, and it and its impact on your lives and more specifically uh, here in Oregon and more specifically here in the uh, Tri-County area, Multnomah County, for that matter, and uh, we'll I will just take a take a heading from um, the Oregonian today, who's who's working in Oregon. We'll talk a little bit about that, tell you about that part. But before we go into that, we're going to take the first half hour and talk about the 50th anniversary of the Dr. King uh, uh, festivities. And I'm sure if you had any access to radio, TV, talk shows, or whatever, pretty well bombarded, right? I would say with uh, with that whole issue. And it was some very interesting stuff, and, um, and it was really good. It was very, it was eye-opening and whatever. So it sort of brought back memories, even within my own stand. But I've got two other, I've got two guys here with me today. You've seen these guys before. They too have some memories and and something to say about that particular piece. So we're going to get their thoughts on what they felt and and, and about um, the whole issue of the 50th anniversary, and uh, we'll do that. Like I said, the first half hour, and if time permits, we'll we'll throw in a couple. See if we get a couple questions from the audience. We'll open up the line, maybe the first half hour. And then, then we'll come back. Then when we come back after we break, we're going to spend some time on the, on the, on labor, on Labor Day and, and its impact. And Because the bottom line is that there's a lot of folks that are that are unemployed here in the state of Oregon. And it's something like 171,000, according to the latest uh, Workforce 2000. And unemployment rate is still hovering at 8.7% employed 1.79 million labor forces 1.96 million well you know a lot of times it, it, it has no meaning to a number of you that are out there if you have a job if you have a job okay mm -hmm. fine business as usual but then on the other side of the, the folks who are unemployed what is it costing you you know what is it costing you and so we're going to talk a little bit about that so with that as you know you know john sweeney hi john how you doing glad to be here good good that's john sweeney you've seen john here before and you've seen you've seen Bob Williams, you know Bob. Hey, okay, Bob. Glad and to be here. and each has their varying backgrounds, especially when you start thinking about uh, the labor part. Um, Bob's been very heavily involved in the in the union. In fact, he retired, if you will, from what, what was that? Was United it? Food and Commercial yeah, Workers. Yeah, United Food and Commercial Workers. And then uh, John, on the other hand, has been working worked for the city of Portland for a number of years and retired yep. from the city at the Parks Bureau. Aspect of it. So they got quite a bi extensive background in the whole issue of labor. But besides that, getting right into our show today, uh, we're talking about the 50th anniversary of, uh, of uh, Dr. King and all that business, whatever. And we've talked about that on the show on many areas, whatever. So we're always, in fact, I, I, I tend to identify the area as uh, the show as a kind of an outreach program. We're constantly bringing issues to the table. In some cases, you will agree with us. Some cases, you don't. But at least it gives you an, an opportunity, a forum, if you will, to kind of think about what is going on around here, because that's really what the problem is at that time. Okay, with that, why don't we start off with the uh, the 15th anniversary of the, the the deal? First off, John, what was the rise of John? What do you think? How, well, how did we it was to interesting, you? and I watched news reports and uh, some of the specialty programs, a little bit of them, and and some of them were quite good and uh, covered the uh, the facts of the case pretty good. And then uh, some of them, they uh, kind of glossed over it. But most of the coverage was good, and most of it was factual. And uh, they had a chance to sort out some of the uh, things so that they could lay out the, uh, the prog progression of what went on in that day, you know, 50 years ago. And, and they were actually able to find 
more people who had been there and had a chance to have uh, some interesting interviews with some people who had been there, and some of them that had uh, had quite uh, humble backgrounds that had spent a lot of their money to get there for that occasion, and um, they were quite teary about it, you know, remembering it. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I were to ask you, where were you uh, when Dr. King was was shot and killed? I guess it was in Memphis, Tennessee, in the Lorraine Hotel. Mm -hmm. That day. Can you remember kind of an idea? And then the reaction to that. There was a reaction around the country, right, in regards to Right. Well, I, all I uh, remember that particular day is I come home and the fact that uh, the uh, the news came on. No, there was a regular program on, and they broke in into the, the uh, program and talked about Dr. King being uh, killed. And then uh, a little later, they had a little more information on it, and then they started uh, falling down where they uh, found the perpetrator. and. And uh, tried him and convicted him. And but you were you were at home doing that. I time? was basically at home. At home, okay. How, did you get involved in, in it at all? Uh, no. Later, the um, uh, when they had some of the aftermath regarding uh, some of the riots here in town, I was in the Army National Guard and I was in the MPs, and we got into. So they activated you. Uh, yeah, yeah, they had a, they had a couple of riots, <clears throat> and I remember uh, being activated and and. Uh, I was on active duty for 30 hours, and when I took my helmet off, I thought my f head was going to float to the ceiling. And, mm -hmm. But uh, okay. and then we got real serious about uh, riot control, and and we changed from uh, rifles with bayonets over to uh, uh, riot batons. So, but uh, that's and, where you were. Yeah. Okay. So I it was Again, starting uh, starting off the training where we were using using rifles okay. with bayonets, and then they changed okay. over to. Uh, All right. To uh, riot batons, a okay. safer. Yeah. Okay, Bob, what do you think? Um, well, when I, uh, you know, looking at looking at this, uh, I, I was in Washington D.C. Uh, for the 25th anniversary, and we it was still it was still on the mall, and I, I from there from the beginning when I saw it to the 25th year, to this one, it looks like it's beginning to dissipate. I mean, go down in statue, i.e., the number of black participants, the number of people that, that participate. Um, I, don't, I, I really don't know what, what people are trying to say uh, because uh, to the people that the march was for, because it was about jobs, freedom, and justice. You know, and the justice wasn't just for blacks; it was for all, because it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of whites being uh, yeah. uh, discriminated. Against, well, I can't say discriminated against, but uh, caught up in the they justice system yeah. as well. Uh, but the message in some of the marches, and I watched a number of them on TV, and I've seen a large number on YouTube. The message wasn't really clear. Hmm. It was. It was kind of like. A politician's opportunity to say something, mm -hmm. to sh uh, to let people know that I'm here, mm -hmm. but just you know the words didn't didn't really make you feel anything, uh, and that and that's the one thing that uh, Dr. King did. He made you want to get out and do something, mm -hmm. and that's the difference in, that I saw in the marches, uh, you know, that went on uh, last week versus uh, the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the Air Force when Dr. King was killed, uh, stationed in New York uh, at Stewart Air Force Base. And I remember uh, a lot of people crying and a lot of soldiers uh, on their way to Vietnam uh, in the Air Force uh, crying and going, and a lot of people wondering what was this country coming to. And a lot of young men asking the question, if they're killing the killing our the person that's that's trying to do right and be and not be violent in it, what what's what's what are, what are we, you know? And uh, it was a, it was a lot of questioning during that time. Okay. I guess uh, my response would be that I was in the Marine Corps, and I was in a little town called Millington, at a naval base, going to advanced electronic school, and uh, and that's when he was killed and whatever. In regards to um, uh, the marches. You know, I can still remember the, the first march in, in Washington D.C. Uh, I I only thought that was one march, 
but there were two marches because mm -hmm. the women weren't allowed to, to march with the men. That was interesting. Yes, and I I, I learned that uh, through through looking at some of these some of these some of the pieces, some of the stories that were coming out. And this time around, there were two marches, as you know. The, the Reverend Sharpton put one march on, right? And uh, he had a march, and everybody was there. And then they had a second subsequent march on the twenty eighth. I think that then they basically they basically identified that with the the presidential piece because I think the President Carter was there and. And President Clinton was there, right. and, and I guess uh, President Obama. Uh, and President Obama, mm -hmm. but then the, the the Bushes weren't there. President Bush, both father and son, weren't there. I guess both of them were ill at that point in time. But but Mark, that was kind of an interesting piece, and I, I agree with you. That was kind of like more political, right? And they were touting, and and the representative Lewis, John Lewis, was. I mean, it looked like you. you he was everywhere. He was everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And, but there, but like you said, the, the statement uh, I agree with you should have been jobs, economics, and solutions. Uh, solutions. What do we? Where do we go from here? What are we going to do? What's happening in the system? Uh, you know, the education piece and whatever, the Pell Grants piece. There was a lot, a lot of things that I thought we could have been discussed along that line. They had a number of discussions, but gee, you had to have five TVs in the front of you to get the, get all the responses, and I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, that was that part of the deal. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, where, where do we go from here? I mean, we've had now we've had these two activities aspect of it. Oh, one thing I want to mention: I I didn't see that many Hispanics there. I, I thought they, there would have been a, a a whole load of folks on the immigration issue, there. right? Because typically, um, uh, and then and, and just being factual, uh, uh, the uh, Reverend Sharpton, more specifically, always tend to identify the various other groups. But then the, the the other groups don't identify the blacks, right? And that's fact, right? Okay, so I thought it would have been a I thought it would have been a, a mass, if you will, of, of 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 people doing his march, because there were some other issues that were on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, talk about. It. Well, are you, are you, solutions. Let's uh, talk about some solutions. Well, where do we go from here? That's a good question because. You know, a number. You know, I'm one of those guys. I'm a, I'm, I majored in history in uh, high okay. in, in college, okay. and I like to read a history book. And one, and then I like to go back and look at some of the numbers because I I wasn't that that good in the higher echelon of math, but I can add one and one. And I know that it comes up to two. And when you do that, and you look at where blacks have moved from the 50s to uh, let's say 2011, because that's where uh, the census kind of cuts things off. Uh, we haven't gained anything. I mean, we're still the last hired and first fired. We're still fighting for equality. And we're still wondering, uh, will we be able to vote? I mean, the Supreme Court has taken away some of the Voting Rights Act. What I mean, all of these things... You know, but we are told that we are better off than we were then. Well, the world is better off than they were then. So, of course, by natural progression, we have moved also. Mm -hmm. But overall, we're in this, basically we're in the, you know we're in the same place that we were 50 years ago. Hmm. John, what do you think? Well, uh, I think your Where numbers, we is, your, your we numbers is about the same, maybe increased a little bit. But I think the deal is it's a matter of uh, talking with each other because you know. The, uh, the high elite, they want to go back to 1890 where 10% of the people own 90% of the stuff and uh, we need to, uh, they want us to fight among ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so the thing is that we have to recognize that, you know, we're all people and we need to work on our similarities. And, and I live in an all-white neighborhood out in the uh, southeast and one day a few weeks ago a young black fella come walking down the street, you know, kind of just come along. And it was a nice day, and I said, hey, a nice day. And then he looked at me, yeah, it is, you know. When he walked down the street, his head was a lot higher because he was, you know, somebody acknowledged him as a human mm -hmm. being, you know. And this is the thing is that we need to talk with each other because we're more alike than we're, we're unalike. And that's the thing that we've got to capitalize on is our, our uh, being alike, you know. Look at the facts, the... Uh, the criminal element's only 2% of the population, and the IRS is total uh, uh, compliance with, with IRS laws exceeds 87%. Right. So what does that tell you? Almost all of us are decent law-abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing is that uh, is to uh, 
talk with each other, you know, and the deal is uh, to acknowledge each other and uh, try to, uh, you know, buy American to uh, have cultivate American jobs because that's the biggest uh, cure for crime is jobs, not more policemen or courts. Well, let me ask you guys, I'm throw this on the table. In the last election, last presidential election, as you know, there was Governor Romney and then, and then, then uh, the incumbent uh, President Obama were running against one another. And the famous statement came out about the 47 percent. And uh, and so what, as, a, as a result of that, the Republican Party made it a point to say, well, look, we're going to reach out. We're going to reach out from the standpoint of to the 47 percent. Uh, I've heard all versions of uh, who, <laughs> who, who fits the 47 percent. But um, uh, I'm more inclined to say 90 percent as opposed to the other 10 percent. You know, it's like anything right. else. But the bottom line is that I thought that was an interesting kind of a deal. So my point is that it, it, it's it's on the table from the standpoint of reaching out. And and as we know, the, the definition in most cases of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is that the Republican Party tends not to want to be inclusive, if you will, of the 47 percent. But it's identified as the Democrat Party. They tend to identify with the 47 percent. Talk about that a little bit. What do you think? Well, for me, are we in the right timing for now to talk about this? We most definitely, yeah, because uh, for me, uh, the if you look at the if you look at the parties and the structure, and what you see in the in the Republican Party is business. They're about business, uh, whether a big business, small business, it's business. And so, the Democratic Party is about people. And so when you start dealing with the people, you can include the 47 percent, because uh, if my, I'm a, I know I'm going to miss uh, something in what uh, uh, candidate Romney said, which was uh, the, the, the majority of the 47 percent is on the government handout. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the people on welfare, the people on housing, uh, people that have government jobs. I guess that's government welfare, you know, and. When he said, when it was reported, I kind of laughed. I'm going, man, this guy doesn't even know what's going on in the world today. But how do you get those people active? Because it, it's hard for them simply because they are working and striving every hour of every day to put food on the table, to have enough money to survive, to live on. They're the ones that have that low-paying job that, every, that uh, a lot of people on the other side of the aisle is saying, hey, $15 an hour, that's too much to flip a burger. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it takes $15 an hour to live in this country right now. Uh, so... My, uh, sometimes when I'm doing a speech, I tell people, remember, slaves had a job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they, the only thing they had was a, was a meal of some kind. But there was a job. Yeah, and a, and a cot so they could go and continue to do their job. Well, in today's society, everybody's supposed to be free, you know, and why can't these people make a living wage? And yeah. so that's... Well, you know... What the, about that 47%? You know, it really got me to choke up. And the thing is that when it includes retirees, well, the thing is, with people retiring, that makes room for the young, see? And so, it, and even if you deduct the uh, the retirees, and I would fall in that 47% because cause he said it one time, see? That's, remember mm -hmm. that one time. Now, I'm 73 years old, and back in uh, 63, early 64, I was drawn unemployment for three months. So that puts me in that 47%. Mm -hmm. Well, I was not at work because I wanted to be. It just worked that way, and then I did get a job. So uh, basically, that's not painting everybody with a 12-inch brush. I mean, it's a 12-foot brush mm -hmm. because it's too broad, and they didn't uh, explain it, or they didn't think it through first. You know, it's sometimes uh, generalizations... Uh, really prove stupidity uh, beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened when he said this 47% because it covers too many people. And, you know, they say about welfare, well, you know, some people are on welfare because they can't help themselves, and what are you going to do? Not do anything and then they end up turning to crime? You know, it's, it's. Uh, I remember when uh, there was a committee that come out, this is with the, with the hard times and there was a lot of people laid off. How come crime didn't what? The reason crime didn't go up, they had extended unemployment. So people had some money and some hope. 
and the off-budget benefit was less crime. You weren't having people mugging you on the street. They weren't breaking into your house. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, 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 things worked out in a way, but the deal is that statement about the 47% uh, was, was stupid, and, and because they didn't explain it later, which may or may not have been covered by the press, depending on how they felt that day. I want to throw another thing, that piece on the table here. You, in fact, you made, the, you made the point about government. You know, often people think it's like a, some other individual out there mm -hmm. when you say government. Right. You know, it is a society of the people, by the people, for the people. We elect folks to represent us to go to D.C., mm -hmm. right? Right. And they are the ones that sign off on the laws, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but, but, but the point is that the way these things have come down to the table, you don't know who basically introduced the policy, and in some cases, who, who even sign off on the policy. Or what the policy or the, what is. the policy is. I mean, w w <laughs> what about that? Talk, well, talk well the thing is that... You know, what's your definition of government? Well, how do you define, would you define government? Well, the thing is it's uh, supposed to give us certain services. And in fact, I was with the Portland Parks for 32 years, eight months. And okay. I enjoyed my job. You know, and I started as a laborer and retired as a park supervisor. And, and uh, the Portland Parks prided themselves saying there was a public park within three quarters of a mile of every citizen in, in But who was making the rules? That's what I'm looking at. Okay, the, the, city, right? the city council was making the rules and they were uh, doing different things that were... And you understood that? Oh yeah, I understood that, you know, because... Uh, you, you specifically knew who basically said, oh, we're going to open up this park. Somebody introduced the, the deal, right? Right, right. And, they pay, and, the, and our, our representatives signed off on the thing, right? right. That's right. the way it is. But, but there's this big thing about government's problem. When you think about the 47%, that, that was all inclusive of that deal, saying. Well, big uh, government, big government. It's, it's, you know, I'm a firm believer that this system is designed so that everyone can be affluent, cannot become affluent. Someone has to be the worker. Someone has to be looking for a job and someone has to have given up because they've been looking for so long they're just discouraged and I say that the, what you do with that person that's looking you help them until they find and what you do with that person that's discouraged you help them until they begin to look mm -hmm. you know but we have this 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 group of people out here that want to get into government that says hey the government is not a, not about helping people, you know. It's mm -hmm. not about uh, uh, it's a, everybody think it's it's expected. It's it's uh, it's you expect government to help you. Well, I don't expect government to help me if I get if I lose my job. I expect for that I should go out and try and find another job. Mm -hmm. And when I and but while I'm trying to do that. Yes, I pay taxes. I put money into uh, in a savings account. And, so and, yeah, and basically in that savings account, mm -hmm. give me some of it to let me live, and so that I can move yeah. forward to try and help myself. Mm -hmm. And do I think someone should be on welfare for twenty years? No. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, when uh, President Clinton tried to do a five year thing. I don't know. If, you know, I said, "Wow, yeah, that's a maximum." A maximum. Five years. Five years. You, you, you collect five years worth of unemployment. That's it. That's uh, five years welfare. on on welfare, and that's it. You know, you got five years to try to get yourself into a better position. You know, maybe five years wasn't long enough. Maybe it takes seven, but at least you know you know what you got to do. Get your butt up and start working. Don't lay there and have babies. And that and you know when you start talking like that, most people look at it and go, "Are oh, they talking black?" Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'm talking people. Cross if you board. don't think so, watch 16 and pregnant, <laughs> you know, and you'll find out that it's not black kids only, you know, uh, it's so kids across the board. it's kids the across the board. And that's what we have to do. We have to stop labeling. I'm a Democrat. You're a Republican. You're a, you're an independent or you're whatever. You know, we are human. Mm -hmm. And this is the human race as we were taught yesterday. And we need to stop making us black, white, green, yellow, and blue, and become one people trying to move ahead to make this country the best country it can be one more time and again. 
You know, well, at, at one point in time, they had said in regards to the welfare, i.e., subsistence or helping out with the food, and stuff, the churches and charities were taking care of that. Where, where are they today? That John? was before the Vietnam War, and what happened with the Vietnam War, a lot of guys, as the war's going on, they come out of high school, so they duck into college and they get their bachelor's degree and stick their head up. The war's still going on, so they go for their masters and they get their masters stick their head up the war is still going on so they go after the doctor and they come in there and they find some young gal hey babe let's get married and have kids and then of course a few of them they end up getting a divorce and then ex mrs so and so guess who's who's not married anymore and they got drafted anyway but uh <laughs> that was but uh that's part of the uh the deal is it and we don't have the draft that, that has a uh uh, a direction that guys have to, something that they have to face, right. you know, because um, I tell all young, young, young people, I says, you know, young guys and gals, when you turn 18, you, you, uh, you register the vote. So when you're talking to a politician, you wave that little card that you gave a voter's pamphlet or a voter's card because they're going to pay attention to you because most time, if you're under 30, you figure you don't vote. And for the guys, is to sign up for the draft. Even though they're not drafting, you still have to sign it. There's something you, that you have to do. And the other thing about government, there are a lot of slams is uh, that, you know, government people, they don't, don't work hard or anything. Most people do a good job, whether it's public or private, and they want to go out there and feel at the end of the day they've done a good job. And, uh, but that's a slam to say that they've got it made and they don't put out. And the thing is, you know, they, they have it easy in the service, or they have it easy on the government, and and uh, it's the fact that most people have a job, want to do a good job. In fact, a lot of times in government, they defy you sometimes to do a good job. Well, you know, I'm, as I look at this article, and you think about it, it says 8.7 percent are unemployed. That's the unemployment rate across this country. You know, no, that, this is in Oregon. Or in 2000, 8.7%. So if it's 8.7%, that means that 92, no, 91.3% of the people are working. Right. Yeah. So what's the issue? Well, the, well, the issue is <laughs> okay, that they want to get, get 100%. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I've always identified the 10%. No? Well, if you're part of, if you're part of 8.7, you're concerned. Yeah. So why is the majority is concerned about the 8.7%? Well, one of the things is even during World War II, when there was the greatest strain to get people occupied, you know, they were either in the service or they were working. The unemployment rate was still 2%, and they had to have the what it was the Biscotto uh, uh, project where they had the Mexicans come across, you know, legally to. Uh, Work doing different field. work, but the deal is, you're 100% in uh, pop, uh, employment is probably absolutely impossible. Well, the closest thing is the military, right? Because you're in the military, everybody's working. <laughs> There's no unemployment there. Okay, but I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, I'm going to throw that on the right. table. There's a major concern about the 8.7 percent, but then there's a lot of jobs that are generated just talking to that. Fair. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> so well, no, you. Uh, the job is already generated. Talking to that, they want to keep that job. Okay. So that's what that's okay. all okay. about. In well, fact, I throw something out. Because we got, we do have a, a labor department, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, our employment department, right, so to speak, right? And you, you know, when this thing came out, this term came out that uh, on the, on the immigration issue, the discussion was that there were a number of jobs in this country that Americans didn't want to do. Right, and that was the, some of the justification for the immigration piece, mm -hmm. legal immigration. Well, I've always been asking the question: What are those jobs? Right. So, do you know what those jobs well, are? Well, they said we didn't <laughs> want to pick berries, we didn't want to do farm and heart and labor of that nature. But all of a sudden, we we didn't want to build houses. We didn't want to. <laughs> we didn't want to do lawns. We didn't. We didn't. You know, uh, we didn't want to cut trees. But a job is a job is but, a job. But I mean, what I'm I, saying what, is. <laughs> This is this is how they get low cost labor in right, there, right. Uh, and they disen they they disenfranchise the people in this country, and bring other people in and bastardize them, pay them low wages or no wages. Uh, they don't have any medical insurance. No one can talk about them. Then the, then they get their people their people in Congress to pass a law. Uh, Farms Bill Act that says that uh, you can't join the union or uh, make it difficult for you to, you know, and all of these things. And it's all, when it all boils down, 
it's about money. It's always about the money. It's well, about the, the money. The thing know. is, that, real quick, because like, we got, I'm okay. getting ready to break. The thing real is, quick, I quick. talked to some guys and they, they they wanted some money to go to a concert. They went out to Sovies Islands to pick berries. Right. Big sign on a four by twelve sign says hiring, and two white guys showed up and they wouldn't hire them because they were white. They wanted Mexicans. Well. That's an interesting piece. Well, kids at yeah. one point in time were picking berries you know, for their school clothes. They can't even go off there They now. went to the legislature, and the legislature outlawed that piece. I wonder who put that piece together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if we're going to take a short, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back, and hopefully we'll get on another side. We'll still be talking about John, right? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, welcome again, again to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and I've got some of my my my, my, my solid co-hosts with me today. And we're talking about uh, Labor Day, and and we also talked about talking about the whole issue of the impact of uh, the 50 year uh, the, the situation with Dr. King, 50 year anniversary, if you will, of that piece. And we talked about that a little bit too. And we were just getting into the second segment. We were talking about about labor, mm -hmm. Labor Day, right? People working in order. In Oregon, for instance, uh, we've made the point about, I saw the Oregonian here, that the labor force for Oregon is 1.96 million people in Oregon. Uh, employed, 1.79 million that are employed. Uh, the unemployment in Oregon is 171,200. The unemployment rate is 8.7%, right? And now what we've been talking about of late is that... Uh, uh, this business about uh, jobs that uh, uh, that Oregonians don't want to do. Well, one let's list the jobs. I mean, we hopefully we got an employment division, right? Right. And uh, and people are, uh, i.e., receiving recipients. I mean, receiving money, right? right? Checks, right? I mean, th there are some people that are probably receiving the check that would just like to do any kind of work. I mean, I see people. On the, on the sign, whatever. You're basically, right. Look, I want to work. I'll work for anything, whatever. Mm -hmm. And these are just small jobs. Why couldn't those people be given the opportunity to work to, to apply for those jobs? Well, it's easier. Uh, how do I say this and not offend anyone? It's what easier. It? It's easier to control the people you are working if they are there one illegally. Mm -hmm. Two, totally dependent, mm -hmm. and three, uh, know that if they say something, they're going to lose everything. Whereas if you, and that, that comes into uh, the people that have crossed the border illegally and they are working, uh, it comes to um, when, you, when you bring a person in, like you were talking about, the white guys that went down to the berry farm. The first thing I got to do is watch those guys 
because they don't, they don't, my attitude is they don't really have to be here. They could be doing something else. <laughs> you see? So now it's, made, it's putting more pressure on me. Are they really here to work? Or are they here to see what's going on so that they can go back and report? You know, all of those things come into play. I mean, I remember in 1970, and I came here in 1972. And in 1972, I take that back, 71. When I came here, black kids were working at McDonald's, at Burger King, in places of that nature, because that was their summer jobs and their and the money that they would make For to go to school. Yeah, okay. Today you walk in there, you find a black kid. You know who's that predominantly? Uh, uh, Latinos. They've take you know. Uh, you go to a restaurant. I remember going in restaurants, uh, and there were black waitresses. Try to find one in the city today. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, we're bought into this idea that we can all have our own business. We can all have our own job. And now all of a sudden, no. we're all without work. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to come together and talk about these things and make a plan. How do we plan to make life better for my kids and my grandkids? Across the board. Across the board. And believe me, when blacks move ahead, everybody moves ahead. Because that's the way the country is. But uh, if you get a group of whites and they move ahead, you'll be looking and hoping somebody send the rope down to get you. Mm. You know, so you got to, you got to begin to think about this in a in a different vein. You know, go into your office, those of you that have a job, look around and see how many black people are working there, mm -hmm. and say, "Wow, I'm an endangered species." Mm -hmm. It's just is that's why you know it's kind of like being in the jungle. Uh, being out in the woods, if it's only three or four of them, the government say that's an endangered species. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to protect them. And how do you become endangered? Say the wrong thing. Disagree with someone. And all of a sudden, you're gone. They bring someone else in to fill your spot. But isn't, isn't it the... Um, John, I'm throwing that out to you in regards to the, the leadership among our, our community, if you will, in most cases, uh, the folks who re represent, uh, are supposed to be representing us, who are sitting up in the legislature, are supposed to be having these kind of discussion and coming up with solutions to get people to work well, and solve these problems, like picking up the barriers and why aren't the kids being able to pick up the barriers and what about these jobs that they're not wanting to do? Why aren't we having those discussions with our leaders? Why aren't they doing that and making the point? Well, they, they responded to some pressure and, and uh, they wanted to say protect the kids. So then the deal is that they end up forbidding kids from doing almost all, all work. And then what you have now that they don't talk too much about is underemployment. And uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the high unemployment numbers, you go applying for some of these jobs, they want outrageous qualifications for a Mickey Mouse job. And you know, the uh, things, uh, said loud and you know everybody's being pushed to go to college and more and more education and these people are coming out 25 years old with a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt you know by the time they pay it off they're going to be 40 years old before they could think about buying a house or starting a family and that's uh really destroys the the whole system because people aren't starting when they would normally start, you know. What about our education? That's a good point. But what about the education system? I can remember when I was going to school, voc ed was part and parcel of the K-1 to K-12. They're starting to get I, that I back. And, uh, uh, the Labor Commissioner, Brad of Arkan, was talking about they're pushing through the legislature to get uh, voc ed back into the schools. And, but what uh, about the school system itself? I mean, we got school boards. <laughs> we got but, people who get elected to school boards. They were pushed Should more, they not have the discussion? They were pushed for more and more about uh, computer skills and all this kind of stuff, and and all of this stuff, and, and like the this Common Core for ed, uh, for education. You know, they they're saying that well, we're getting more stuff that have the kids better prepared. If you look at it, there are more classes, but actually, it's for to hire more teachers, not necessarily or better prepare your children for, for work. Because when I was uh, coming out of high school, they had a work track and a college track. And the deal is those who didn't want to go to college or felt they didn't have to or want to, the deal is there was this other part of the education which included some voc ed that, that helped them get good jobs. You know, you get a lot of them uh, show up uh, 
who have no uh, skills, you know, they don't know what wrenches are and stuff. In fact, one guy showed up to uh, uh, work for the parks one time. He had spent his, he was 27 years old, spent his whole life living in uh, condos and apartments. He had never mowed a lawn. And then, it, and uh, at that time, we didn't do much uh, hand mowing because I had power trim mowers, but had some stuff to do. And this guy was thrilled to actually do something physical to actually run a lawnmower. Mm -hmm, you, know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you and I, we, well, we all. What was the breakdown in the system in there? What, what happened in that, Bob? Because well, I remember that the trades, the unions used right. to really get involved in that. They had, they had training, they had trades. I mean, the apprenticeship, all that other good stuff. What happened? They began to t uh, to uh, to tell the kids, education is the. Uh, they took away education is the key, mm -hmm. is what they did. They stopped telling kids that. And they began to, but when, when parents began to not have jobs, then they didn't have time to monitor the kids or the kids didn't have the things they wanted. So they were beginning to act up in school. When they began to act up in school, the teachers began to be monitors and, and control monitors of the kids rather than educators of the children. And so when that happened, all of a sudden, things began to break down. And so when they began to break down that way, and then they said, well, wait a minute, the money isn't right because the tax money, when the parents are out of work, the tax base goes down. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to have something. So what's the one thing you cut? Let's cut these shop classes. Hmm. So you cut the shop classes. Then you cut music. Then you cut dance. You know, but because you're so certain that you want to give the impression that they're still getting education. And those administrators who are making those decisions have never been there. Right. They weren't down there. They so down there. so that, that's, what happened. that's what happened in the school system. The, the tax base went down because the jobs went away. And all of a sudden, people began to move away from the area. And uh, when, when it was affluent, people began to try to move up upper mobility, they began to move up and out, and those schools began to suffer. You know, it's a good, you make a good point on that, but what comes to mind right off the bat, any small product, a gadget or whatever that you pick off the shelf, whether mm -hmm. it be Walmart, Kmart, or whatever, made. it always says, made in China or made in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Those jobs were here at one point in time. Right. How do you get those jobs back? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I had this debate with uh, one of your friends uh, yesterday. That was your friend. <laughs> and <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, it. <laughs> and yeah. like I said, if you, uh, like you said, most of those jobs were here. Right. The company business have no loyalty to any country. People need to understand that they're about making money. And if they can take their business and make the widget in China at 30 cents, versus paying two dollars or three dollars over here they're going to china and Isn't so that what our society is or it's a capitalist society? it's a capitalist society so how do you get them to so feel? what what we have to do to them is say just because you have your your office here doesn't mean that you get free tariff bringing that stuff back here you know if it's not built here you pay to sell it here you know then they are not making the big profit that they were making That'll give them some incentive to come back here. Or we, or we, the American people, can do it ourselves and say, when we pick it up and it says made in Taiwan, made in Japan, it doesn't say made in USA, you leave it on the shelf, you know, and say, I'm going to suffer a little bit, just a little, I'm going to suffer a little bit and not have that. I'm going to substitute, I'm going to substitute something for that that's made in America. I guarantee you, you'll see some of those, country, those companies coming back. But at the same time, I throw this out to you, John, a lot of times, but the majority of the people out there, some, of, some may be looking at the show, but the mm -hmm. majority are not looking at the show. And, they, right. they, and a lot of times, they don't, they're not as familiar with the fact that, well, if I don't buy it, if you will, it will have some impact on my right. getting a job, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's not being communicated to them, fair? Right. Okay. So. So uh, I'm reminded about the obesity thing. People keep talking about obesity aspect of it. Well, I mean, wait a minute. We can't, when you go down to that Burger King, you buy it for a dollar, one dollar. You buy five of them and just start eating. You That's know, it. You get, you get heavy and 
and that's what's going to happen to mm -hmm. you. But it's still, i.e., about the dollar. Right. And there's no regulations on that, right? Right. John? Well, it's true. Well, the thing is, it's still the thing is that I uh, try my best to buy American-made things, and I try my best not to buy Chinese things, because I look at China as a very uh, potential enemy of this nation and our way of life. And I tell other people, you know, like Bob said, you know, not to buy that thing, to, to pay something more for an American-made product or to do without. And it's important that we do that because if the, the businessman has got $50 million worth of Chinese goods that he can't sell, why, you know, he's mm -hmm. got to figure, what, what am I going to have that I can sell? But then some people are just protectionists. Here we go again. Wait, wait a minute. You can't, you can't do that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, but we, you we, can. We, 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 yeah. It's for your own benefit that you do these things. Okay. You know, I mean, you can't sit around and complain about not having a job mm -hmm. as you as you subsidize the person that's taking your job away. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they do it to us. Somebody has to be smarter than this. Well, now, again, we talk about capitalism. Now, let's let's make make it very clear. Even though I made the point about made in China, made in Taiwan, right. there's a middleman in this country. Oh yes, that's making a buck. Oh yeah. Okay, the product just didn't come directly from China. Someone, an American, actually put together a business mm -hmm. that's making a profit. Basically bought by this selling, product. By selling That's product. That's right. And then someone basically approved that legislation said it could go on the shelf. Right. Well, and so with, what the, we, with the name of the company on it. But here's the thing. <laughs> we have to say to them, hey, thank you very much for sending it over here. And you're going to find out that you're not going to be sending a lot of it because a lot of it's going to be on the no, shelf. No, but I'm talking about the businessman that's yeah. here and, and bought the product. Why not say to the businessman that brought it here, okay, fine. You can put USA on it because, in all due respect, you're the one that's responsible for bringing it over here. Then you, that's a lot. That, uh, because that's not... They're getting paid. We're talking about production. Production, all right. Okay. Now. Okay. And if it's being produced over here... Okay. You know, it's not helping us we because need production. Uh, we, we need, need the production. The production. That's, okay. that's the point. And the people and, and the companies are moving off, offshore and doing the production and keeping their, their home office here and saying, hey, I'm an American company. So who do we, well, who do we, well, that, that so who do we convey that to? Who do we can convey this issue that Bob just made? Who do we convey it? Who do it we talk to? What person? Convince people to buy No, no, America. not people. What person? Who do, who, do, who do we call? You call your congressman. There you go. Well, there that's there you part go. of it. There the you dealers go. in today's paper, they also talked about uh, more of the products being made here because of the fact that the cost of, of uh, labor even in China has gone up and the fact that the cost of shipping, the, the, you know, running the ships to get it here has gone up. So a lot of the things are changing to be made here. But more that we demand that we buy American products because the deal is if I buy an American product, I'm putting my neighbor to work. If they buy an American product, they'd be putting me to work when I was working. Okay. But the thing is, it, it's, it's still, uh, it used to be we had the tariffs and now they don't. And the thing is that you ship something to China, you mm. can't do ship directly to the customer or the direct salesman. They run it through several houses, uh, and they put, clearing put, houses, clearing houses, mm. and they add a tax on it every time it moves. Mm. It's um, uh, I forget what the value-added tax, mm. and so the deal is that way. And who approved that? Well, Chinese that's, yeah. that's no, what no, they do. A lot of foreign it has, countries still do. has to go through government, our Congress, right? Because we have not retaliated against them. Says, no, you, you, that's their country. That's how they keep things out and make sure that okay. their people, right. that their people are working <clears throat> and that their products are being sold. They send it through all these different changes. Six, you can send something over to some countries, and four and five months after it gets there on shore, it might hit a store shelf. Okay. Where, because they are protectionists and they can take care of theirs. But we all oh know we're the good guy. We can't do that to them. And if it's a food yeah. product, by then it's rotted. And the mm -hmm. other thing what they've done is they've they found that the citizens of China and Japan and all that, they like certain things, you know, saying food-wise, well, they just start their own orchards. Right. And mm -hmm. the next thing you know, the farmer that was going to do okay, all of a sudden, the market's gone because they're growing. Look, we got about eight minutes, and we've been talking with the three of us, and I'm sure we've solved all the problems, right? right. Well, <laughs> so, we've, at least we've put them out there. Because that means you guys are going to be running for office, right? That, that was it. John, John be running for office. He, he'll solve this problem. There you go. And then maybe we'll, we'll talk about term <laughs> limits, too, for a minute. I think that's another issue. 
Look, let's see if we can get a couple calls in here. Maybe someone might be watching and and maybe they've got a solution to that. Right. I mean, we've been talking about this, right? Is that fair? That's it. Okay, look, caller, you can give us a call. You got the phone number on the uh, on the screen on your screen. Uh, if you want to join in this conversation, you can. Uh, you can re respond to the uh, to the fiftieth anniversary of Dr. King, uh, the march in Washington, and or you can talk about uh, something in regards to uh, Labor Day. You know, mm -hmm. jobs and how do we solve it? Education, uh, voc ed, anything. Okay, you got the number on the deal. But a lot of times people are just sitting out in the backyard now, barbecuing and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. That's me tomorrow. <laughs> but you know, uh, one of the things, if I may, Bruce, one of the things that I I really am. I've been thinking about and thinking about, okay. and that is our kids have no idea of the history of blacks. Yep, okay. It's not being taught to them in the schools. Uh, so it's up to us to take care of our history. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, the Indians used to, they put it on stones and, uh, mm -hmm. and sh to show what the battle was and where people were and mm -hmm. things of this nature. It's in a book. And it's called uh, Black History for Beginners. Okay, let me put it over there. Hey, Tom, why don't you see if you can get that there. Bob's got a book here that he says that uh, uh, the, the black community, African Americans, right. should actually give this to their kids. Everyone, right? everyone should read this. Okay, I, okay. You know, okay. everyone should read this book. It's not just blacks. But everyone should know the history uh, of slavery, how things came out. And what you're going to find is there were some good uh, white people back in those days that didn't agree with slavery, like the Quakers. And there were some okay. that were killed because, uh, that were not Quakers that, uh, because they were trying to help. And we need, to, we need to get the history out there and have our kids understand where they came from so maybe... Someone won't write a report that says between 2000 this and 19 this and 2000 this, 290,000 blacks were, were murdered. It says Black History for Beginners. Black History for Beginners. Denise Dennis. Right. Right. Well, now, how do you get this into schools, let's say? Uh, it's going to take parents uh, pushing for it. Okay, and, and then that what, should what, be what, in the history. That what, should what be about in one of the history buying it? That, can you parents get a should buy it. Store and, or some any, any one of the right. the bookstores. You can order it, right? You right. Can actually, order it if you want. Got a lot of pictures in here. It's kind of neat. It's kind of an interesting piece aspect of it. Actually, it's always good to know who the author was and and who wrote the book. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it says all, all, on sale at bookstores everywhere, but it otherwise is unavailable. Maybe ordered from 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 us. I right, please add a dollar to cover postage. <laughs> Okay, but the bottom line is that it is a book. Right. Look, we got a caller coming in. Caller, you on the air? Your question or comment, please. What do you say? You got a solution to the problem that we, we've been talking about? Uh, I have a comment regarding Bob Williams' comment regarding history of black in America and the lack of knowledge that our young people have. Okay. Um, I don't recall. I know Bruce, you will probably know, but... Uh, Bob Williams, I don't know if you know, Glenn Beck introduced Founders Friday, and at that specific program, he brought to light the lack of black history being taught in our schools, and I think as parents and uh, people living within Multnomah County, we need to start going to these PTA meetings. We need to start being part of the uh, school board process where we pull in books that specifically talk about black history so we can start teaching that to our children because I think it's the rich and wonderful history that needs to be taught. Thank you very Thank much, you. Sally. In fact, Sally is part of, part of the team here for us mm -hmm. reaching out in the Republican Party. See, so we're doing it. Mm -hmm. She's reaching out to you, Bob. Yeah, I see. That okay, all right. Yes. Okay, we got another caller. Caller, you on the air. Your question or comment, please. Hey, Bruce, it's uh, young brother Webb checking in. Oh, Mr. West. Oh, boy, we got Mr. West. You know Mr. West, oh, don't yeah. you? Well, how you doing, Mr. Hey. Brother West? Hey, my. Hey, hello, other guest. How are y'all been? It's just been fine, a couple years, fine. but I'm still around. Well, give, 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 <laughs> us, give, give us some insight real quick, like we got about another three minutes. Going on. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, um, this one, I was watching what happened with the little march, and uh, I'm not going to say it's a little yeah. march, but it okay. wasn't really as many people as they expected there. Not as many buses actually came, so I'm, you know, I'm still looking in to see exactly what kind of count 
that uh, you know Reverend Sharpton and, right. and the others had pulled in. You know, but that's I mean, interesting. I, they didn't give the count, did they? Uh, not as of yet, you know. And there is some discussion about some people who were not invited or invited. You know, some people who I mean, you know, I've heard some things thrown back and forward. You know, political accusations about who were invited and who decided not to attend. And you know, we could start a whole other show well, about Mr. that. Well, Minister Farrakhan wasn't invited. So that's my understanding. Okay, I, I got about yeah. another minute. No, we got two calls. I, I, I got no, nice two minutes. Left. I, got, I got another minute. Go on, real quick, like real quick. Yeah, you know, but, uh, you know, I might have to just test you to see exactly how much Republicans have come around, you know. Okay. I'm telling you, you guys, you know, I haven't been on the stage with you, but you all need to be looking in at me, you know. I'm okay. Here's a, little news, here's a little quick news bit for you. I led the last part, I'd say probably the last fourth of the march there for Trayvon Martin down there on the, on July 20th. Mm -hmm. And so, I, yeah, I, I led the crowd. Okay. You know, so, uh, yeah, so you what? might want to check that out by going to Flickr and looking up on that date for the march in Portland. And all I right. invite all your guests to well, listen. Hey, and well, thank you very much. Look like we're running out of time at this point in time. But thank you. You need to come in here and visit and kind of get to be a part of the discussion here with us. We're looking forward to you getting back to me. OK, if you can get those two guests back, I will come in next week. How about that? No problem. Sounds good to me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, look like we've gotten down to that point. I appreciate the caller, both callers for that matter, and, and that's what it's all about. You know, we've got to communicate. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, I think we have advanced quite a bit. We, we're at the point where we're sitting out here talking about it. Right. I mean, with all of the proliferation of guns we have in our society, people are running around shooting one another, not too, not mm -hmm. too many. I mean, you know, but my, we don't have that too many in Less right? and less. Less and less. Okay, good. Huh. Well, okay. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, uh, we welcome you to continue to Again, like I said, get out and communicate. Talk about this issue. That's what it's all about. And I'm doing it. Bob's doing it. John's doing it. And the callers are doing it. Yep. And do it. get with your neighbors. Uh, yep. Call your teachers. Get those elected officials that you elect every year, and then all of a sudden you don't see them anymore. <laughs> get them involved in the process, okay? But again, thank you very much for being with us, and we'll see you next week with another interesting program. Have a good one.